We're going to be talking about Web Service Application Programming Interfaces, or APIs for short. And I recommend having some type of knowledge of server-side scripting. My example here will be on PHP. I'll explain it pretty well. So if you're using a different server-side scripting language, it shouldn't be difficult to at least get the general gist of what I'm doing and be able to adapt it to whatever language you're using. Uh, web service APIs, they are an extension of your website. Uh, they allow you to add additional functionality for people to access that does not force them to bring their browser onto your site. They can then do certain things programmatically, access your site. You can provide tools for them through the API, whatever you choose to open that interface to. This video is particularly about building these, so we're going to talk about how are they built, how can you build one, uh, what should you know when you're building one, um, and why on earth would you ever want to build an API? Bragging rights? No, actually there's a little bit more to it as well. Um, some of the best, most successful websites have good APIs, but they provide a lot of extensibility. Uh, once you see what an API can do, once you've had a chance to play with them, uh, you'll start to see that there's a lot of value to an API. But one of the things I really want to talk about, first of all, is something you should know. You want to plan out this thing. Plan out the details of your API. Whatever you're planning on doing, plan it out and document it. And then make sure that what you're building is going to meet that documentation. This documentation should be very detailed. You want you don't want to sit there and count on knowing what that, remembering how to use that web service at the end of the day when you built this thing in the morning and you've built three other web services that day. Chances are you won't remember what this thing did. Uh, at least exactly how to do it, especially if you've been doing other things. So make sure you have some information on here about the basic. You want to bring you want this to be readable by somebody who doesn't know about your API. They know very little at all about... It. It's great to make these things where they're easy to use for people who know very little about programming and are accessible from many different languages. And web services provide that independent functionality. So you just create a request to the server we're handling that request and we're dispensing that response. They then receive that response and process it. So we want to have something to draw the people into our documentation. Something that will tell them that they're in the right spot. Number adder. Okay. Do confirm that. Give me a further amount of detail. What exactly are we talking about? We're adding two to three numbers and returning the total. Okay. I think I'm in the right spot now good. Tell them that this is something that they can use, where they can go to use it. And, you know, this is the documentation. You want to have this information in here. You want to tell them how to request and how to get a response. Exactly the details of everything on here. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, your number, you know, in our case, yeah, we got our number adder. What type of request methods? Now, REST is the best to support. If you can support REST, great, uh, because that is very accessible. It's the most common type of query that there is. More languages support it more easily than anything else that there is out there. Use rest and use a very easy to parse response if you can sometimes you can't use rest sometimes you're trying to deal with more information that will fit in a url because url spaces are limited and maybe if you're trying to send a whole file up or something like that you won't be able to use a rest query sometimes you will have to go to post nvp or some other format. Maybe you're trying to accept an image. Uh, whatever that be that you're using, you want to make sure that's documented. Uh, there are many different formats that you can use on here though. and We're going to
touch on it a little bit uh, but not going too deep into here there's also like soap and there's XML and there's JSON there's all kinds of stuff that you can use um, but yeah rest with with something very easy to parse like JSON would work in many languages well let's take a look too we want to have details on our variables and we want to know if there's case sensitivity lowercase on get as shown on post so yes case sensitive we want to know that what are each of the variables what should they be and what types of options do we have are certain things optional what format are we dealing with numbers you know this is a string one or the other and then how is my response going to be gone how what do I should I expect I shouldn't have to test this to find out what the response is I should have a good enough detailed description in here to be able to know what am I getting back when I call this because I'm not generally going to see this on my browser I am going to be seeing this well I'm not going to see it at all it's it's going to be handled by some code so I should never see the response of of my web service <clears throat> it should be handled by my code so that's what a person developing for this API should be thinking I'm never gonna have to see the response so I need to know what it is to be able to know how to program for it so all those details should be in your documentation definitely now let's take a look at a sample of a web service okay and on here this is that web service that we talked about so we support post and then we also support the other one which is get <clears throat> down here else get and those are the two main types now if they did uh, request using like a put method or something else like that it would also be handled down here which is not good so this is it should be else if and uh, you know, it really should be something to say this is going to be for get and then have something else down here to handle anything else which would be handled as an error sorry request format not request method not supported but in our case this works you know we've got post up here and we've got get down here and you'll notice these are all lowercase these are all proper cased and this is a good method to go about to go ahead and just set up everything as variables go ahead and call them on in and find out you know is that set because this was optional now this should also be checking to see if it's set and setting it otherwise too we didn't do that uh, but in our examples we will be showing that uh, that variable would be present in all of our examples so we won't have to worry too much about that but we did say that was default so it should have been checking to see if it was set well we're going to gather all of that information out of our out of our form variables or out of our query string variables and once we're done getting all those in there whatever method we have to go about doing we will then have all of our variables set that way we can work with this and then we can also log any detailed information that we need to do if you need you know if you want to keep logs and find out what's going on have that information in here throughout whatever you're doing have that have that log right into to what you need and here we're checking to see if they have the right API key if they have that then we let them do what they're going to do if they don't we're going to tell them access is denied 403 error code and we have a HTML page if it's requested otherwise we are going to send it as plain text we send out a page that says hey access is denied so let's just take a quick look at that real quick okay API key will be not one but easy enough to put back and plain text and we're going to try and add one in one what happens when we do that error access is denied okay what about the HTML page version
wow, it gives me a page. So I can work with this either way I want to. Awesome. That provides me additional options. Whether or not you want to produce a page or not depends on whether or not you want people to be able to link directly in there with their browser. But, you know, it's up to you. You can use you can use these options. You don't have to provide multiple options out. It is extra trouble, as you're seeing on here, to do that. But it can be really useful if you're trying to access it from many different languages, different people with different uh, knowledgeability with their programming. Maybe they don't all know how to use one type of response. Maybe some of them would prefer to get an HTML snippet so they can get that. But, you know, so we can handle access denied. But if it is access is granted, then we're going to be up here. And there's so many different types that we can have in the way of our, of our outputs. We could send it out as, as XML, as JSON, RSS feed, if it's that type of data to send. Um, you know, an HTML part of a page or a full page. So maybe you want to run it in the process of generating a page or use it as a part of an Ajax response to be able to fill in a, a section of the page. Um, you know, you might want some HTML marked up stuff in there. Comma separated values, maybe even generate a whole document or image, whatever you choose to. Or you could just set that. You can just say, you know what, I'm only going to support one. It's up to you. You're the programmer. You do what you want. But this is how we do this. So if this number three was not put in there, yeah, we set it to zero. That's what we did. We're just going to add up all these critters. Number one, our response data is number one plus number two plus number three. Comes down here, response format. We're finding out what we're dealing with. Is it HTML page or is it something else? So if we misspell it, whatever else we choose to do, if it's not HTML page, we're going to get plain text. And if everything's good, we get a plus response data. If things are not good, well, I mean, if it's, but if it's an HTML page, if it's not good, then we get that minus down here or whatever error we added. And then over here, we have the HTML page. So now we can say we're going to set the content headers. We want to do this, especially if we're working with a web service. Make sure that we're sending the right content MIME headers to because that might be checked. And that's a good way, too, to tell the client what are they getting because sometimes they will check for that and they'll say, oh, I got plain text. I should handle this differently than what I was expecting to get, which was my HTML output or which was my CSV file page. So set that stuff. Make sure if you need to, change over your status codes, set up your uh, content information, and uh, send that information out. And so send out your request body using the echo or whatever you use in your language. But on here, yeah, I created a page. And PHP, this is a end of execution delimiter, so this is no longer executing. Now we're just dumping, and then we're back into execution here. This is continue. So we're adding, you know, we've got our, our header on here. We've got our title. We've got our header. We've got, or our head, rather. Actually, the head is a section, but our, that's a header. I'm sorry. That's a header. Different than HTTP headers, but that's a different header. And so then we have a paragraph, and we insert it into that paragraph, our response data. So that way it's nicely well-formed. That way, if we do form our stuff up right to use our service, we get a well-formed page. And if we choose not to, or if we just don't type what we should have, that's case sensitive the way we entered it, then it's going to default to plain text and give us our plain text response. We said we were leading it off with a plus or a minus, and then that is our response of one plus one. As we can see up here, that's what we were doing. Number one, number two. And once again, we've also got that other optional number in there. 
and these are case sensitive too. So if I try to enter this capitalized, we won't see it. It'll say, hey, that does not exist. Whoops, it didn't recognize the other number. So the exactly what you choose to do and how you choose to code it, it may depend a lot on your language. Uh, if you're writing something in uh, visualstudio.net and using the SOAP based API system that's going to be way different as well you're going to have different requests different responses just the whole nine yards is going to be different there I do recommend also providing the legacy API format like what this produces this is a legacy API there's also SOAP APIs available through .NET, that's to be able to send object references and stuff like that. It kind of creates an object that can have whatever it has in it. Uh, but these are ways that we can create this in the legacy form, which is very easy to access with things that don't support SOAP natively. Not everything supports SOAP. This is the main way to do it. So yeah, um, well, however you choose to code this, though, is uh, up to you. Yeah, but I do recommend kind of centralizing it like that, like creating all your variables and then coming down here where you start to do your different things. You know, start your logging, start your, your other stuff in here. Funnel it together so that way if you have an error somewhere, you're not going to go, wow, why is this only giving me a weird error only under certain circumstances? your error that's being thrown might be down here and maybe it's because you didn't capitalize something up here and therefore it's only on the get requests and only on a certain type of response that's going to give you an error and that's where it does get to be a little bit more tricky with these multiple types of responses so if you want to tackle that it's an option it will add value to your API but if you're only using it for you for just a little something you might want to keep it simple. Thank you for watching.